Our civilization is under attack. First they came for the statues of slave owners, and I did nothing because it's a statue of a slave owner. Then they came for the president on Twitter. Why did this happen? Was it the communists? Or was it the people in charge of the terms of service? We, we just don't know. What we do know is, shortly after he addressed a crowd in DC, a mob of a few thousand strong stormed the Capitol building in an act of civil unrest unparalleled by any since the 19th century. The congressional procedure was halted by rioters, and the boundaries between man and beast have now been dissolved forever. Though their intentions were unclear, the one phrase, stop the steal, was chanted several times during the attack. Was this a protest? A riot? A failed coup? Well, personally, I don't care, because whatever you want to call it, the QAnon beer hall putsch has since been condemned by just about everyone, not least of all, Donald Trump. Some people, however, aren't completely satisfied. It's been speculated that Trump's ban from social media was owed to him personally instigating the riots. But did he? After all, he didn't literally tell anyone to storm the Capitol. Well, let's talk about that. If you met a little boy and you liked him and you suddenly discovered he was a Catholic, what would you do? Go away from him again. Why would you do that? Because he's a Catholic. Well, at the Mass, the priest takes the wafer. It is round. It's made round purposely, for it comes from Babylonian idolatry. It's the old offering of pancakes to the Queen of Heaven, taken out of idolatry and brought into Romanism and made the central place of their worship. And the priest, when he holds up this wafer, and when he dedicates this wafer, he says that he turns it, listen, into the body, bones, blood, nerves, sinews, and deity of Christ. And the Romanist kneels at the altar, and the priest says to him, put out your tongue. And the priest puts what he says is Jesus Christ on the tongue of the person receiving a wafer. And the person receiving a wafer is warned, don't put your teeth through it, for that's your God. And you have not to chew your God. You're just allowed to let him melt away on the roof of your mouth. Part one, the other orange man. Naturally, Trump has been defending the speech that he gave before the riots, insisting that his words were totally appropriate. His supporters have decried his ban from social media and spent the last week retaliating with more George Orwell references than the complete works of George Orwell. However, many other commentators with a reputation for inflammatory language have since changed their tune. Strangely enough, Tim Poole suddenly decided to stop screaming about civil war for a change and simply looked on in shock. He even decided to call out the real culprits causing escalation that being the mainstream media, the Lincoln Project, and the Democratic Congresswoman. Now, I know people have all kinds of emotional attachments to Trump, so I thought we could start this argument by looking at a historical figure instead. The original Orange Man, Reverend Ian Paisley. Ian Paisley was an evangelical preacher who made his name during a period in 1960s Northern Ireland known as the Troubles. Throughout the 20th century, there were bitter disputes in Northern Ireland between the Catholic Republicans, who wanted to form an independent nation with the Republic of Ireland, and the Protestant Unionists, who wanted Northern Ireland to stay in the UK. Paisley, a Unionist, became a leading political figure in Northern Ireland in the 1960s. He founded the Democratic Unionist Party, started his own church, as well as his own Orange Order. A group he would later regret helping to found was the Ulster Protestant Volunteers, whose members became involved in a number of bombings across the country. The Ulster Volunteer Force, a paramilitary wing of the Unionist movement, were known for asking new recruits if they agreed with Paisley and were prepared to follow him. And in 1966, an 18-year-old Catholic barman was murdered by a UVF member on his way home from work. When the killer was charged, he famously told the police, I'm terribly sorry I ever heard of that man, Paisley, or decided to follow him. 
Paisley had also found himself becoming aligned with neo-fascist groups, with names like Vanguard Movement and Third Force. But despite his unsavory connections, Paisley managed to maintain prominence for another three decades, until his late epiphany that led him to finally accept the Good Friday Peace Agreement. The difficulty was, in all his decades of public life, Paisley never explicitly called for or celebrated violence. So why did he attract so many followers who did? Well, as an evangelical preacher, Paisley was known for his bombastic speeches and inflammatory Old Testament style rhetoric. And by inflammatory, I mean he warned that Catholics would breed like rabbits and multiply like vermin, his party slogan against gay marriage was save Ulster from sodomy, and he would frequently warn that Ulster would be sold down the river if it didn't fight for its existence. And though he always insisted that his words weren't meant to imply physical violence, it's pretty clear looking back on it that what he meant to imply didn't really matter. Oh, I wonder why people hate me, because I'm such a nice man. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Paisley spent decades courting the support of militant followers. He led countless events that ended in violence, but he always did it from a position of plausible deniability where he could egg on others without ever implicating himself. And every time someone like him finds themselves implicated in acts of violence, we have the usual rush of people saying, well, I don't know, I mean, you can't read his mind, can you? You don't know he was inciting violence. To which I call bullshit. And I'm gonna show you how this supposed dark art of saying what you mean without actually saying it is something that we all do all the time. And to do this, I'll be using a thought experiment that I've borrowed from the contemporary philosopher Oscar the Grouch. Part 2. Coffee. No one beats about the bush like British people do. If we're the world leaders in anything, it's never saying what we mean and somehow never really needing to. Let's take this example from Ewan McGregor and Tara Fitzgerald in a scene from the film Brassed Off. Do you want to come up for a coffee? I don't drink coffee. I haven't got any. Now, they're not talking about coffee, are they? Coffee has nothing to do with this conversation. In only three lines, both characters have made their intentions perfectly clear without even coming close to stating them. And I would never doubt the courting skills of my conservative contemporaries. If they can understand what's going on here, they can understand what's going on with Trump. Because although he never told anyone to riot, what he did do was constantly tell his followers that the election was stolen, that the mainstream media weren't going to help, and the electoral college people weren't going to help. He frequently failed to denounce militants and his support base. He told the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by, and barely an hour before the riots, he told the crowd, We will never give up, we will never concede. We're gonna walk down to the Capitol because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. And at the very same time, his little uh, Rudy Giuliani was speaking about having a trial by combat. Trump may have dodged a legal bullet by being careful with his words, but whether he's morally in the clear is a different question. He never told his followers to storm the Capitol, but what he did do was invite them up for coffee. His tactics are basically those of a high school bully, waving their arms in the face of their victim, shouting the words, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. When violence does occur, he's the one with his hands in his pockets, walking away whistling. He even condemned the actions of his followers, just as a casino which plasters its addictive games with flashing lights and big prizes will always defer critics to the small sign in the corner which reads, please gamble responsibly. Which brings us to part three, stochastic terrorism. So stochastic terrorism is still a fairly new term, but hopefully I've already showed how its function is pretty easy to understand. According to the national security expert, Juliet Kayyem, it's a method of political incitement that provokes random acts of violence through rhetoric that is just ambiguous enough to keep the instigators off the hook. Obviously the riots in the capital were a bit more direct because Trump explicitly told his followers to go there, but this wasn't the first time he's been implicated in something like this. 
Research from the Academy of Criminal Justice found 10 cases of violent behavior where Trump's rhetoric was directly incited in court to explain a defendant's behavior. Yes, these numbers are small, but that isn't exactly the point. Think of it this way. If I were to make a video directly inciting violence against a certain YouTuber of Bloner Blocks, then a few thousand people would see it and nothing would happen. The incitement isn't a problem because everyone who hears it will go on to commit violence. It's a problem because it increases the chances of violence. And even when the rhetoric is vague, that statistical probability of lone wolf actors taking it as a call to arms is still there. And the more people are exposed to inflammatory rhetoric online or in the mainstream media, the higher chance there is of people taking action. And with this model, the FBI and Department of Homeland Security have both correctly predicted increases in right-wing extremist violence from as early as 2009. But due to the nature of stochastic terrorism, the one thing they can't predict is where these events will occur and when. Millions of people hear Trump's rhetoric every day, and with an audience that big, you have to deal with the fact that some people out there are going to be holding on to every word you say. And if you're not responsible with that power, you might end up with followers like this. Ma'am, what, what happened to you? I got maced. You got maced. By, by the police. <laughs> and what happened? You were trying to go inside the yeah, Capitol? Yeah, I, I made it like a foot inside and they pushed me out and they maced me. What's your, what's your name? Where are you from? My name is Elizabeth. I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee. And why did you want to go in? <laughs> we're storming the Capitol. It's a revolution. I just love that. Look, she's, she's genuinely shocked that real-world consequences are applying to her. But then again, of course she was shocked. The president has been winking and nudging at people like this for years, and the fact that so many of the rioters were baffled when Trump denounced them shouldn't really be surprising to anyone. But where am I going with this? Am I saying we need the state to crack down on these terrorists who never incite violence, just like in 1984? Well, no. The last thing the world needs is another Patriot Act or Prevent strategy. And while I have no sympathy for Trump being banned on Twitter, I don't think a private corporation is exactly the best arbiter of what's fine to say and what isn't. And I'm smart enough to know that I'm too dumb to suggest any new laws. But what I can do is comment on social norms and conventions around discourse. Because if Trump and his followers are given free reign to spam the internet with baseless claims of voter fraud, then the cons of that are, you risk a subset of that population taking those claims to their only logical conclusion. And the pros are, what exactly? The discourse? No. F living in a free marketplace of ideas doesn't mean we need to have flat earthers giving the weather forecast and age of consent abolitionists on the anti-abuse panel. No one genuinely believes this. And every commentator who is performatively scratching their head over whether or not Trump inspired that attack knows exactly what they're doing. We face consequences for certain kinds of speech all the time. And if there is a blurry line between what's acceptable and what isn't, attaching yourself to a ridiculous riot that got five people killed in less than 12 hours is pretty far away from it. And if you're still sitting there worrying about your f***ing free speech rights, then I look forward to seeing your defense of pro-rape activism the next time you're on Twitter. Because if you're willing to make a noise about Trump, but not them, then what you're doing isn't a defense of absolute free speech. It's taking a side. The side that lost by 7 million votes. Beta male.